name is Kenny. Uh, it is not Elder Kenny. Um, so I, I serve as one of the elders. Uh, I'm a son, I'm a husband, I'm a father, uh, father to uh, two wonderful kids uh, and a husband to one Dr. Babe. And so, and so she says whenever I introduce her, I should introduce her as Dr. <laughs> Yeah, I can't sell that one, guys. I'm sorry. But more than that, um, yeah, as I, as I said, uh, I have the lovely privilege of serving as one of the elders, and from time to time, I get to stand up here and unpack God's Word. This is something that I do not take lightly. Uh, this is something that um, has eternal consequences, and this is something that um, is important to me. And so through the preparation phase, uh, just praying that this message, whatever it is that God has in store for us this morning, would impact me first. Um, I've been a Christian for a good, I think I'm hitting 20 years now, uh, which actually isn't a long time. Um, but in all that time, um, learning the same thing over and over again, uh, it's something that I need because I forget. And so this brings us to the season that we're in. We're in the season of Advent, all right? And so... Uh, if this is your first time here today, or you've come back and you've missed a couple of services, uh, we are in the Advent series. We are three sermons deep as of today. There have been two messages. Uh, Pastor Ona, Pastor Jono have just um, really, really been faithful in, uh, in unpacking what Advent looks like, how Jesus rescues us from darkness, how Jesus rescues us uh, from a broken world. And so for this morning, as we continue on this very same theme of Advent, uh, I'm coming here and I'm going to unpack uh, how Jesus rescues us from condemnation. So this topic, this word condemnation, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a word, it's a subject that is basically, uh, it brings a lot of tension. Uh, it's, it's, it's this animal that brings tension uh, to wherever you are. And uh, the common wrestle that comes with it is that if God is an all-loving God, how can he punish people for an eternity, right? And so, so immense is this tension, this wrestle, uh, that a lot of people um, have not come to the faith or even some who are in the faith have turned away from the faith because they're battling to reconcile how is a loving God, uh, a God that we preach is unconditional in his love, how can he punish people for an eternity? How does he condemn people for not choosing him? And even if we to, uh, this, is, this feels easy that we go outside the church, but even the four walls of the church, it's a struggle. Some of us have either lost a loved one that, is re that had rejected Jesus Christ, or some of us currently have someone in our lives that we love, whether it's a relative or a friend, that is rejecting Jesus Christ. And as we pour through the scriptures, we see the fate of those that reject Jesus Christ. And so this morning, um, while... While condemnation is a touchy subject, that's very, very difficult to comprehend, and it's something that we might wrestle with forever, may I propose to us that God's rescue mission and response to those condemned, those that want nothing to do with him, is infinitely incomprehensible, right? That the fact that God, the idea that God lived amongst his creation Ransom is creation is something that is very, very confounding, and it's something that at times we don't wrestle with enough that how is this possible? How is this true that God, the, the powerful God, the creator of everything, would basically come down and be part of his creation? So confounding is this idea that the psalmist wrote in Psalm, in Psalm 8, the very famous line, what is man that you're mindful of him, a mere man that you care for him? And so as we engage in how Jesus rescues us from condemnation, as difficult as it is, and I get it, this is something that we'll wrestle with forever, 
I want us to just first understand that in order to have a true grasp and appreciation of the cost of the freedom that Jesus Christ purchased for us at the cross, we need to know what Jesus Christ rescues us from. And so if the Lord permits this morning, I'm hoping to faithfully unpack, unpack what is condemnation, uh, why are we condemned, and how does God respond? But before we continue, let us read our anchor text for this morning, and then we'll pray. And so our text for this morning is John 3, uh, verses 16 to 19. Uh, you're more than welcome to follow on the screen. You can also follow on your device or open your Bible. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his, his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned. Because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light, because the deeds were evil. Let's pray. Lord, first and foremost, we want to acknowledge you as the one true God, um, the one that we worship, the one that we bow to. Uh, this is the one that we sing songs about. This is the one that um, has come. This is the one that is still coming, and that is the one that is um, active in our lives daily. And so, Lord, with this uh, very heavy, touchy subject of condemnation um, that is before us, let us be reminded, Lord, that you're a just God, uh, you're a loving God, and you have not left, our to, left us to our own devices. You have not left us to condemnation. And so may we anchor into what you have done at the cross. May we anchor into your rescue mission. May, be the, may this be something that does not become common in our lives, but something that we continuously anchor into. It is no ordinary feat for you to come down become part of your creation, uh, to ransom your creation, to be the author and perfecter of our faith. And so, Lord, with that in mind, whatever it is that we're carrying, whatever condemnation that we are carrying, uh, whether it's condemnation from the world, whether it's condemnation uh, that comes from reading through the scriptures, may we be reminded, Lord, that at the cross, all of this has been taken care of once and for all. And so, Lord, I pray that and then of this message, or even during this message, uh, may, be re may it resonate with us, Lord, that there is no condemnation for those in Jesus Christ, whether it's those that are still coming to Christ or those that have been in Christ for a long time. And so, Lord, may you, may you be in me. May you help me with my words. May you help me with everything um, that I have to say that uh, this is in me. May I take a back seat. May I merely be a vessel of your goodness and your kindness as you speak through me, Lord. And so, Lord, we pray all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. So, what is condemnation? So, if we look at the dictionary definition of condemnation, we see uh, three main uh, definitions. So, the first one is uh, to be declared uh, declared to be reprehensible, wrong, or evil. So what we often, what we often see is this. Uh, this will usually be used in politics, right? So a specific person or a group of people uh, commit an act that maybe is deemed morally reprehensible by most people. And so it's usually a race for the politicians to use the famous words, we condemn the acts of X, Y, Z, right? And so in using this term, we condemn the acts. Uh, this is a declaration that whatever has been done is wrong or evil. Another definition that comes up, uh, it's to be pronounced guilty and sentenced to punishment. So we tend to see this especially in law. So someone is found guilty by the court of the land. Uh, they're subject to punishment. And this punishment can be expressed through time served, uh, but this can also be expressed through uh, paying with your own life. Uh, this is the instance where there's a death penalty. 
And then another definition is uh, to officially be declared to be unfit for use, right? And so we tend to see this in building regulations where a structure is assessed and according to a set of rules, a set of regulations and standards, um, it's determined that this will not fulfill its intended purpose. And so it's declared unfit for use and it's commissioned for demolition or destruction. And so what we see here is that even within a circular worldview, the idea of condemnation, um, it carries with it quite a heavy weight. But here, here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. So uh, you can't just go willy-nilly out and be condemning everything, right? So for instance, uh, if I go to my social media page, if something has happened, whether in the country or somewhere else, um, across the continent or across the globe, uh, if I go and say I condemn the acts of X, Y, Z um, on my social media page, it literally does nothing for geopolitical relationships. <laughs> In actual fact, I might just even get one view. It means nothing. And so even if, another example, if I go to a building which I see and I say that this isn't supposed, people are not supposed to live here, and I tell people that I condemn this building, it means absolutely nothing, right? But if the building inspector of the city of the town writes a letter and he says that this building is condemned, then whoever lives there or around there will listen. They will take heed of what is in that letter. Same thing, if I stand in a court of law and someone that has wronged me, and it's obvious, and I say someone who's guilty and I condemn them to a prison sentence, means absolutely nothing. It is merely my opinion. But if the judge walks in, enters the room, takes his seat in the judge's seat, and he says, this person is condemned, then people will listen. So church, what we need to understand here is that the weight of condemnation is proportionate to the power, authority, and position of the person doing the condemning. I'm going to repeat that. The weight of condemnation is directly proportional to the power, authority, and position of the person doing the condemning. And so this is something that I'll come back to later on. So we, we've explored and we understand a, a condemnation from a circular worldview. And so when we go into the scriptures, this is what condemnation looks like. And these are maybe verses that you're familiar with. Uh, Romans 6.23, it reads as follows. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Second uh, Thessalonians 1 verse 9 um, these will pay, and these people that uh, Paul is talking about in this instance is people that have willingly rejected Jesus Christ or people that don't know God. And he says, this will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And so as we go through the scriptures, we can see that there is a weight as well in the scriptures in terms of condemnation. And it's an eternal weight that we pay with our lives. And I understand, I can see that Paul here says the wages of sin is death. And it doesn't mean that we die immediately if we sin. But this is, a, this is a spiritual death. This is separation from God. This is a strained relationship with God. And we see this every day. And when we go into Second Thessalonians, what we understand is that we don't merely, when we pass away, we don't merely go into oblivion. We are not annihilated. But that there is a price. There's a sentence. And so, as we continue, our first point, why are people condemned? And so, the subject of why people are condemned, it's a rather tricky one because no one likes to be told that they are wrong. Uh, more so, no one wants to be told that there are consequences uh, to being wrong. And so what we often see is popular phrases like um, Christians are so judgmental or who are you to judge me? And more often than not, what is attached to that is uh, who are you 
uh, to tell me how to spend my, my money? Who are you to tell me how to um, spend my time? Who are you to tell me what I can do with my body? And often what people are trying to do is to minimize accountability and the extent of their wrongdoing. But when you look at the scriptures, we see the following, and this is, we're going back to uh, a scripture for this morning. This is verses 18 and 19 where John says, anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. And so two things jump out from verses 18 and 19. So people are condemned because people haven't believed in Jesus Christ. And this, this one statement, has it's such a subject of much discourse because we struggle with the absoluteness of Jesus Christ, Right? We struggle with the idea that Jesus Christ is the one and only way. That salvation only comes through Jesus Christ. And so what, what, what John is doing here is being clear that there is no other way that you can be saved. There is no other rescue plan that, uh, that is as effective as what Jesus Christ has done. And so Jesus Christ ascends the mountain. He has no peer. He has no equal. He ascends the mountain. He stands there as the incarnation of, of God. He stands there with power, with might, with glory. And on top of that, he stands there as the one true rescue plan. And, and I get this. This is, this is very, very difficult. This is very, very difficult, especially living in a country like ours where uh, as a black person, what we, what we are trying to do is, to do is we're trying to reclaim our heritage. And so often what comes out is, hey, um, what did we believe in uh, before colonialism? What is it that was before that? And we tend to say that, let's, let's go back to that, you know? And so for me, honestly, as difficult as it is, let me propose and say that there's enough room to reclaim our heritage while still keeping Jesus central as the one and only true God. And so what tends to happen is that we struggle with this whole idea of uh, the fusion of culture and religion. And so we think that in reclaiming our heritage, we have to reclaim the whole thing. And what I'm saying is that, guys, we have to look at the scriptures with veracity. We have to look at the scriptures, regardless of how the scriptures arrived, who they arrived with, what the intention was with the scriptures. Is it true? But we also have to look at our culture with the same veracity. Now, just, just because I was born into this culture, what they say about religion, what they say about salvation, is it true? Right. So as we move along, we move to our second point. <clears throat> and so the second point is that people are condemned because... People prefer sin. And so when we reject Jesus, we're in, se we're in essence uh, choosing darkness and evil. And so verse 9 reads as follows. This is the judgment that light has come into the world and people loved, da loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. So if we look at this, Paul, Paul goes hard on this in Romans um, and so in Romans, uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 9 to 18, it reads as follows. What then? Are we better off? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Jews and Greeks, yeah, in this context, he's, he's basically saying Jews and Greeks, but in our context, when you read it, he's saying everyone. Everyone is in this, right? And he says, that is, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands that they, who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There's no one who does what is good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. A viper's venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are, sw are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their parts. 
and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And this is very hard to take. And most of us are probably thinking, I'm not any of those things. But what Paul is declaring here is that not only do we not seek after God, but none of us do what is good. In actual fact, we pursue what is evil. And hear me, because God is the standard of everything that is pure, everything that is perfect, everything that is good, as soon as we divert from God's plan, then we're pursuing evil. And this is a very hard truth to swallow. I get it. Because often what, what we honestly do is we, we don't use the lens of, uh, of God. So through the lens of comparison, uh, we often use our colleague from work, uh, our neighbor. Um, we use our friends. And I will tell you that the lens of comparison will always work out in our favor. There's never an instance where we compare ourselves to someone else and we come out with like, man, I'm a terrible person. That guy's a good guy, right? So what this tends to do is that it yields an in inaccurate diagnosis of our condition. So what we end up doing is we, we walk down the aisle, we go to a pharmacy, and we, we try to get pain meds, off-the-shelf pain meds. What we, when we, what we actually need is a, it's a, it's a triple bypass surgery. And so the truth of the matter is that the depth of what is within us, it required God to leave heaven, to dwell amongst us, to die for us, and to be resurrected. That is the depth. This, is, this isn't something that you can fix by a three-step plan. This isn't something that you can fix by even coming to church every Sunday. This is something that only God can take care of. So the best thing we can do is pray to God and ask him to reveal the depth of our brokenness so that we can appreciate the depth of his rescue mission. And so as we move along, how does God respond? Right? How does God respond? So there are many ways in which God could have responded. Um, one of them being letting things be. And the, the honest truth is that a lot of us are maybe in this space, right? Um, many of us feel like, man, it feels like God has let go of me. It feels like I'm under this heavy weight of condemnation, and I feel like I'm carrying this by myself. There's a sense of hopelessness. There's a sense of like, man, is there any hope, or am I supposed to do this myself? And so... The Bible tells us otherwise, right? The Bible tells us otherwise. Throughout the Bible, God has been responding towards his people in love, consistently pursuing his people, consistently pursuing his people. And it's people that would have nothing to do with him. And I, I, love, I love how Pastor John painted the picture of uh, Jesus coming last week, um, how this was no, it was no ordinary event, but it was to... A very ordinary people. And Jesus Christ arriving at that moment in time, it forced people to have to respond. And so what we see is that God sent his son. And, and if we pause a bit, guys, just the whole idea of God sent his son, that, that alone just speaks volumes. There's a lot of weight to it. So God doesn't, doesn't send his angels doesn't send any of the myriad of spiritual beings. God sends his own son, his unique son, right? This was personal. This was very, very personal. This was a rescue mission that was not coerced. This wasn't a rescue mission that was obligated and for me, that's, that's a great deal of comfort because what it means is that God is coming after us. And there's, there's a safety there. There's a comfort there that uh, if this morning you say, God, I really need you, that God will meet you where in that specific place, regardless of what you came here with. 
So I, lo- I, love, this, uh, I love this verse in Hebrews 5, where the writer of Hebrew, uh, Hebrews writes the following. Uh, this, is, this is about Jesus Christ. Therefore, as he was coming into the world, he said, uh, he did not desire sacrifice and offering, but you prepared a body for me. You did not delight in whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. Then I said, see, it is written about me in the scroll. I've come to do your will, God. And God's will is that many would come to salvation. God's will is that many would come to know him. So if you're wrestling with the idea that will you be accepted, I'm telling you this morning that you'll be more than accepted. That God has done infinitely more than you could ever imagine to bring you into his family. And so this rescue mission comes straight from the heart of God. God takes the first step. And so let's read John as he captures God's response uh, to free us from condemnation. This is verses 16 to 17. It says, For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So what we see from this uh, is God's response. And so God responds, responds by putting his love on display in two ways. So God gives his son and God gives eternal life. So when we look at God giving his son, what we know is that how God gives his son isn't just a merely giving of the son, but he gives him up to suffer one of the most excruciating deaths on the cross. This was the worst kind of death. And even scripture tells us, cursed is the man that hangs on a tree. And so Jesus suffers the full unbridled wrath of God. But this isn't because of anything he has done, right? This isn't because of anything uh, he, he had done in his life. But this was on account of us. So this is what theologians would call substitutionary or vicarious atonement, right? So this, is, this, is, this, this motif is something that we see uh, throughout the whole of Scripture, right? This is basically, um, this is Abraham and Isaac. This is the ram in the bushes, right? This is the Passover lamb. This is the goat that goes into the wilderness. The difference in this instance is that uh, Jesus Christ becomes the true ram. Jesus Christ becomes the true Passover lamb. Jesus Christ becomes the true goat in the wilderness once and for all. And so in simple terms, uh, Jesus Christ has taken my place and all the condemnation that was, that was due to me uh, and it was all heaped on him. And so instead of me serving time for, what, of, for crimes that I haven't willingly done, my willing disobedience, Jesus Christ stands in court and he says, Judge, I will serve the time. So what we need to understand is that God does not overlook our sin, right? Because here's the thing. When God overlooks our sin, there's this struggle of that. This could come back to haunt me. This is something that could come back later on. But no, through Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ atones. He serves my time, meaning that that time does not have to be served again. This is something that, never, that will never follow me ever again. And so when I approach God, I approach God knowing full well that I am free from sin, that God accepts me as I am through his son, Jesus Christ. And so, if you're you're carrying the heavy weight of condemnation here, I'm I'm here to tell you that you don't have to. You don't have to. And so if you feel like, man, I need to get my life together, (laughs) let me tell you something. Uh, That will never happen, (laughs) right? That that will never happen, right? We're, We're in December now, and all of us are going through some of the things that we failed to do from January. 
Some of us have maybe even been in this space of failure since the end of January, and we've just been carrying that weight. And the truth of the matter is that no one, no one has their life together. Guys, no one has their life together. And this, this is, this is, this, this, you just have to go ask people, hey, how's your life, right? And even people that answer positively, there's always a pause, right? And that pause is just you going through your mind like, man, maybe I'm happy with my marriage, I'm happy with the space that I'm in, but it's always followed with a but. And that, that will always be with us in life that, man, this, this could be better, this could be better, this could be better. And so most of the time, people that you think have got their lives together, they're faking it, right? They're faking it, right? So whether it's the person that, that earns 100,000 per annum, 1 million per annum, 3 million per annum, 10 million per annum, we're all in the same boat. All of us are consistently seeking something better, and our lives are not getting any better. And so your, your argument might be rightfully so, like, yeah, well, man, Chris, Christians, their lives are also not perfect. Like, if you go and ask a Christian, they will also pause, which is very true. But here's the difference. What we understand is that this is a broken world, and our joy, our happiness, isn't anchored in what is happening here right now. What we understand is that, ultimately, we do not control anything. And so, if today my marriage is great and tomorrow it's falling apart, ultimately I know that God controls everything. And so for me, when I look at us as Christians, what we can ultimately say is that, man, we have our lives together because our lives are in God. That God is the one that controls, God is the one that sustains, God is the one that directs. So I can just, with great comfort, take my hands off the wheel and let him take charge. Whereas, if you feel like, man, I can't trust God, you will constantly have your hands on the wheel, and you'll constantly be trying to keep it steady, and life is happening. And so, what an amazing proposition is this? What an amazing proposition is this? And so, for me, my question is, why are you not accepting this? Why are you not accepting this? Right, so I've painted the picture of condemnation. This is a, it's a very, very hard topic, right? The idea that, you know, people, people will suffer. People will have to pay with their lives, right? People will have to undergo wrath. But I've given this, this proposition of that God basically says, hey, there's a way out. And this is the proposition that God makes. And the question is, why? Why are we not accepting this? So, man, if, if you're in this space, if you're still struggling, my encouragement to you is, man, please don't, don't misuse this time. Please come to the front. The elders will be here. We want to pray with you. We want to talk to you. Right? We want to walk you through this journey. Right? Don't miss this opportunity. And so the strange thing is with this proposition is that as earth-shattering as it is, it's not all of it. So what God has done in Jesus Christ by taking away our condemnation is confounding, but it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. God also gives us eternal life, right? God is constantly giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving, and giving to the point that who can say no to this? So in the famous award, award-winning movie, Shawshank Redemption, it's a very old movie, released in 1994, there's a, there's a character called Brooks, right? And so Brooks incarcerated, uh, he's committed crimes, he's basically been in jail for 50 years. And so finally he gets to the point where he's freed, um, he's paroled, um, this is great news, he can start a new life outside, right? So goes out to live out his, his life in the open world with his freedom, but when Brooks gets out, he realizes that the world is very different. He realizes that the world isn't what it was, and it's a very lonely place as well. 
So what Brooks does is he ends up taking his own life. So why, why this story? I'm saying this story because God grants us more than just freedom from condemnation. So God doesn't just say, you're free and he just lets us be. But he, God, he does more than that. So when God gives his son, he also gives us eternal life. And so this idea of eternal life is uh, captured well in John 17, 3. One of my favorite verses it says, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. So eternal life isn't just a place or a thing in the distant future. Eternal life is a person to be known and experienced. So when Jesus rescues us from condemnation, we get freedom from condemnation. We get freedom to know Jesus Christ fully, so much so that we are called co-heirs with him. And we get freedom to know the Father fully to the point that we can refer to him as our Father. We can say, Abba, Father. We can approach him in any way. We can approach him any time. And so, for us, it becomes a matter of that God has given so much. That God has just gone over and above. And so God, unlike, unlike with Brooks, who basically his life was, I'm free from incarceration. I've got this freedom. He goes out into the world. He's got no family. He's got no wealth. He's got nowhere where he belongs. He's got no identity He's got no meaning in his life. God doesn't do that. Instead, God frees us from condemnation, but he says, uh, you're a son, you're a daughter. Here's your identity. You're a co-heir. And the list goes on and on and on and on again. And, and, and a lot of this f almost feels like it's maybe directed to people that haven't crossed the line of faith. But to some degree, for us that have crossed the line of faith, a lot of us look like repeat offenders. So this idea of repeat offenders is people that are released from jail. They go out into the world and it almost feels like the world is not as safe as they want it to be. And so they purposefully actually commit crime so that they can go back. And so for us in the faith, why are we living like repeat offenders? Why are, we stealing, why are we still carrying the guilt of condemnation on our shoulders? Right, because here's the thing. I, I, love, um, I love this uh, scripture from Romans 8, right? And this is where Paul basically says, uh, and, and I, I love it because it, everything that comes before that is the famous Romans 7, Right, so this is, this is the great struggle. You know, this is Paul basically saying, hey, the things I want to do, I'm not doing, right? And the things I'm not supposed to do, those things I do. And his response is, there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And so as I land the plane and the band comes up, I'm going to take us back to what I said. So I said, remember, I said the weight of condemnation depends on the power, the position, and authority of the one doing the, con the condemning, right? Now, imagine that very same person with power, authority, uh, with the position to condemn you, now says there's no condemnation. He says there's now no condemnation. And we need to settle in that, that the, the creator of the universe, through the work of his son on the cross, he looks at us and he says there's no condemnation. Not, not tomorrow, not anything that you are still going to do, he says there's no condemnation. And this is the great rescue mission, that when Jesus died on the cross, it was once and for all. That now, no condemnation means that whatever happens in my life, when I come here, when, when there's whispers in my head that are saying, but you did this last night, the, the response is there's no condemnation. 
right? And if you're coming here and say, man, my life isn't perfect, I still need to, there is no condemnation, right? And so, at the, like right now, this should affect the way that we do life, the way that we do work, marriage, the way that we step out into the world. But this, is, this should also affect how we respond. So my challenge this morning is, if you're in a space where you still feel the heavy weight of condemnation, there is no condemnation. This isn't just for today on this Sunday. This is for eternity. Salvation has come today, not tomorrow, today. Respond. Respond. And so, Lord, um, thank you for the safety, the comfort, the surety that no charge can be brought against us, Lord. Whether it's from the evil one, whether it's from the world, whether it's from our own mind, there is no charge against those who are in Christ Jesus. And so I'm praying this morning, Lord, that uh, for those that have not uh, crossed the line of faith, that they may see that it's not Kenny that's speaking to them, but it's the Father heart of God that is that is calling them, that is inviting them to something that is bigger than they could ever imagine. That condemnation is a big thing, but the love of God is even greater. The love of God is something that we cannot comprehend. It's something that uh, for the rest of eternity, we will be marveling over. And we can start to marvel today. And so Jesus Christ, may you convict our hearts. And for some of us, Lord, that have been on this journey for a long time, those who, it feels like we're repeat offenders. It feels like we keep going back and we're carrying that guilt. Uh, may this serve as a reminder, Lord, that um, the sentence has been paid, the debt has been paid, and in you we are free. Lord, we love you. We need you. We are declaring that there is nothing, absolutely nothing like you. There is, there is no rescue plan that is as great as your rescue plan, Lord. And so, Lord, take us, um, allow us to respond in praise and worship. May we respond with our hearts. And may you continue to convict us as we sing. In your name we pray. Amen.